Welcome to the Idea to Value podcast, where in every episode we highlight the latest insights into creativity and innovation from experts around the world. I'm your host, Nick Skillicorn. I care about the evidence behind what makes ideas happen, and I've already helped thousands of people just like you through my unique insights into recent scientific findings of how creativity works. I also show you how to turbocharge innovation programs so they finally deliver on the value and ideas you've been struggling to execute. Get your free training on how creativity can be improved by registering now at www.ideatovalue.com. Now let's get on with today's episode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Idea to Value podcast. I'm very happy to have Ben LaHunt with me today, who's the founding course director at UTS for the uh, Bachelors of Creative Intelligence and Innovation course. Um, I spoke with, uh, with her students a couple of months ago, and it was a fascinating insight into how creativity and innovation is being taught at universities nowadays. Ben, it's wonderful having you here. Hello, Nick. Um, for people who don't know much about you or, or the course that you run, could you give us a bit of a background, please? So the Bachelor of Creative Intelligence and Innovation is a future-facing, really innovative course that combines with 25 other disciplines at UTS. So that's from science and law and engineering and IT to business, communications, design, health, and it sits in a faculty of transdisciplinary innovation. So, so many of our discoveries in the future are going to come from between disciplines, not just within them. And a lot of the problems that we have are so networked now that we need to solve them collaboratively between and across disciplines, not just within them. So the university six years ago attempted to set up a course that address this future of research, future of the workplace as well, because our students are going to be doing, you know, apparently 17 different jobs across five completely different industries. So we really needed something that would future-proof students' education. So conceptually, the degree was created to address the need for a really radically different type of education and to innovate the education system in the process. And, and, and what was bad with the, the old way of doing a university degree? I mean, I remember back when I did mine many years ago and I went and studied geography. You studied that subject for three years and admittedly I never used that uh, knowledge during my jobs. But what about people who are studying business or uh, economics or IT? Is that now a, a useless degree to have? Well, I wouldn't say it was useless. It depends on your concept of what an education should do. And I, surely there should be some depth to any study, right? And that's what a single degree does. And even a hyphenated or barrel degree, double barrel degree that they have, you combine two degrees. But what if you could have learn some principles around problem solving, future thinking, complexity, entrepreneurship, creative and critical thinking that would serve you well throughout the course of an entire career. So you, Nick, haven't remained a geographer, have you? And um, I haven't remained a, an anthropologist, although anthropology is integral to a lot of the work I do. I've been able to jump between fields and use the knowledge that has accumulated over the years, through many domains, through working in creative industries through three decades, through being a novelist, through my understanding of anthropology, and through my personal experiences too. So we teach how to combine ontologies as well as epistemologies. You, how do you combine your being with your knowing? And how do you validate all the experience that you have outside of a classroom and outside of any disciplinary domain? And how do you put it all together? How do you become the ultimate sense maker and innovator and creative thinker in the rapidly shifting world that we have now? And so what, what exactly does that mean from, from a course perspective? Uh, if you say you're doing a, a course in creative intelligence and innovation, I mean, uh, first of all, how, how can you study something like creativity and innovation? And uh, how does the course sort of, how does the course design try and help build those skills? So the best way to study it is in a really applied sense. So theoretical understanding, if you're going to teach people creativity theory, for example, without giving them any practice, 
they'll become theoreticians and it won't be very useful, will it? Whereas if you actually give them a crack at several projects, it will be far more valid. The learning is far more valid. And that in, in the education world, that's called learning through assessment, learning uh, through authentic assessments. So authentic assessments are very uh, real world. They're industry facing. They're current practice. They're often done in real time. Uh, and the criteria that you're assessed upon is value to um, industry partners, for example. So we've just won a big award for our engagement with industry. And we have seven, over 700 industry partners that we work with. And so students have so many opportunities to work closely on real world projects. And that's where the learning happens. Supported by, of course, the academic knowledge and experience. So it's a real third space, if you like, of industry partners working with students, working with academics. And it's unusual, I promise you, for universities for, to be doing this because usually they have this kind of um, factory format, lecture, tutorial, rotating, and that gets repeat, repeated over two semesters a year in Australia or three, over three years, and you've got your degree. So what's the, the primary outcome for someone or the, the anticipated outcome for someone with this uh, sort of degree? Is it being able to give lectures on, on creativity and innovation or what sort of um, real world applications are anticipated or have you seen from students already? So we've had everything from students going on to startups to, you know, within two years of having graduates, we only started six years ago and it's a four year degree. We've had students going off to Silicon Valley and getting funding and doing startups. We've got students walking into top jobs, all the graduate positions across the country and and really sort of hooking into the innovation ecosystem that we've developed through our industry partnership base. So for example, I think Deloitte's and you know, Accenture and all those consultancies, PwC, we have students in all of those organizations. We have students now working in design and account management at Google. We have students working in lots of social enterprise and um, other people's startups as well as their own. So at all levels, we have around 42% of our students are employed by our industry partners because they kind of get snapped up the minute they see what they're capable of and the broad thinking that they've had, the depth and the breadth combined and their ability to collaborate. Absolutely. I mean, it, it, it's a well-known fact that uh, companies are not only saying that creativity is important, but they're outwardly sort of looking for these types of skills now. Uh, in, in the next two years now, creativity is probably one of the top three skills that employers and, and companies are looking for. That's right. Um, and how, how has your journey sort of brought you to this type of degree? What, what sort of gave you the, the impetus to start a program like this? Well, my impetus was to apply for a job that would expand me. I didn't, I didn't, the, the degree was conceived of by the university and I joined it in its first year of operation at the very beginning. So I actually strategized and created the output, the, the educational delivery. But the idea of the degree came from UTS's top level, chancellery level, um, thinkers who really wanted to create something for the future that would be different, a degree like no other, as they described it. And that's definitely what it is. So my experience has been all about creative industries. It's been about creative thinking across domains. And I've always been really frustrated with the idea that you can't teach creativity, first of all. And secondly, that it only exists in the arts. I think it, and, and thirdly, that it only exists in that limited ideation phase of a creative process. I think that there's a, an element of creativity in so much that we do, so many things that we live by. And I've been fascinated by the art and science of it. Um, in fact, I did my doctorate on, on creative thinking theory and practice, and I did a creative doctorate. So I've been in a creative life for years, and I wanted to expand that 
beyond the domains that I knew. So I'm a, a, a writer of fiction. I'm a novelist, as well as being in, you know, creative industries. I think uh, we, we met at a conference a while back, and that's where um, I became very interested in this degree. And uh, I had the pleasure of actually going and speaking with some of your students, as, as we know. Uh, and it's, it's really sort of interesting to see how it's being taken much more seriously nowadays, these skills of creativity and innovation. As you mentioned previously, a lot of people thought it's just people who do artistic subjects, fine art, music, uh, uh, maybe to a degree people who are in the startup uh, space. But uh, it, I, I really always talk with my clients about the fact that creativity is it's an innate human trait that everyone possesses and that everyone should be using much more frequently. Yes, exactly. And, and it's going to be our big differentiator as we uh, reach an age of greater automation and AI and machine learning. We're going to have uh, a secret source that is intensively human and um, important to human growth as well and evolution. So we shouldn't surrender that to machines and we should definitely keep on growing it for a personal on a personal level so apart from its value to industry which is one part of it it's also got an incredible value to a sense of personal flourishing and purpose a lot of the research talks about the more meaningful lives being the the more creative ones so how do you create that sense of purpose and meaning and uh, joy in your work i know a lot of uh, students nowadays are feeling more pressure than ever to, to get the, the perfect grades and to get uh, everything done correctly the first time. And a, a degree like this seems to teach them something a bit different. Have you had any experience where students took a while to adjust to this idea that they can do things differently than they were taught maybe by their parents or in their previous school? I think that this is something that we have to really address, particularly in our first year of BCI. We have students coming uh, it was very hard to get into our degree. You need a top ATAR to get in, top marks from high school. Um, in Australia, you get a grade that ranks you against every other student that started off at primary school at the same time as you. And this grade is something of a signifier of success. And it's highly competitive to get in. One in 17 students gets into BCII, this degree now. Um, at one stage and we've made it easier for people to get in because we never intended to create an elite degree like it's turned out to be. But one of the problems of having students come from high achieving, so many high achieving students arrive in the degree is that they have this notion of right wrong answers which they've been trained in through high school and our high school curriculum is all about competition. So you're competing with every single other person who started school with you. And that's not what we want to have our students doing. We actually have to detox that sense of competition because what the world needs more than anything else right now is collaboration. And how do you do that? How do you teach someone something that goes against what they were taught by their parents, by society, uh, by their school and their upbringing? Well, that's an interesting one. You have to, you actually have to give them the opportunity to try something different. And we also have to take away that pressure to get it right. The right, wrong answer seeker. We have to speak to that kind of human desire. And we do that in our very first school. The first kiss that they have with BCII is all about understanding how to make mistakes. And we do a whole session actually on mistakeism, mistakes that have driven innovation, how to take risks, how to be brave. We give people credit for things not based on the success, but on the process. Those sorts of initiatives, we have to, we celebrate, you know, International Failure Day. <laughs> there are so <laughs> many ways that you can, you can detox that desire to get one over other people by getting a higher grade. And uh, bo both you and I, we're creative people at heart as well. Uh, how does what you teach fit in with how you, uh, you live your own creative life and your own creative process? So what I teach is 
very much integrated to who I am and, and how I am. And I think that, yeah, creative thinking is a muscle that you grow over many years and you don't get it without being in some kind of a creative practice, practice of thinking in a certain way, um, a, a practice of thinking differently, I'd call it. In fact, we even run whole days on how to think differently and on paradigm shifts that have shifted fields and industries and disciplines over the years. And, how, and, and people's lives, getting students to study thinkers who have actually made those big leaps. And we assess on people making creative leaps, like changing from one state of thought to another. How do you make that leap? And so my life is all about making leaps. And I am also a novelist. And I'd say that that was one of the, um, one of the most exciting ways for me to explore creativity. Because as a novelist, you have a tabula rasa, a blank page. You don't have anything that tells you what to write. Nothing will give you a theme on that blank page. It is all from you. So I'm very interested in the inner work of creativity. Hence my interest in, you know, ontology and sense of being, not just knowing. And I think the, the power of the instinct, the power of understanding what is important and, and making connections in interesting and useful ways is always really alluring for me. And, and that inner being, how do you connect that up to your work and, and have a very authentic presence in your work? That's, that, those are themes that interest me. I know uh, a lot of writers, especially, they, they talk about the tyranny of the blank page where uh, a lot of people think, oh, you've, you've got freedom to do whatever you want. But sometimes getting those, those first thoughts up on the, the blank whiteboard or the blank piece of paper are some of the hardest ones to do. That's right. And I think in, in, in creative practice, one of the things we all know about a creative practice is it has constraints. Often, say, in the creative industries, you'll be given a brief, a client brief, and that's a natural constraint. If you tell people to come up with whatever they want to come up with, they, they get lost. Um, and it's much harder to uh, tackle those kind of unknown unknowns, the blank page unknown. Uh, we actually give students a whole a whole taxonomy of unknowns, um, an ignorance mapping framework that we've developed, and we get them to understand the methods for exploring different kinds of ignorances, the unknown unknowns, the misknowns, the, the taboo knowledge, the, the known unknowns. You know, it goes on. There are many different ways of navigating unknowns. But for me, the excitement of unknown unknowns is, is, is the height of it. It's the most exciting era. It, it, the most exciting place to take your creativity. And on a personal note, how do you deal with perfectionism? I know as someone who uh, writes, writes an artistic uh, piece of literature that's ultimately going to be seen by the world, do you ever feel this sense of dread about when something's ready, uh, ready to be sent out to the rest of the world? And how do you deal with that? Well, it's really interesting. So as a writer, you know, you might have heard it said that you you have to write drunk and edit sober <laughs> and there there is definitely a different headset involved in a mindset and a heart set in 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 the two different types of thinking you have authors like sue wolf describing it as construing and tight construing you have people like guildford talking about um divergent thinking and convergent thinking but but that, that critical person who has to sit inside of you as your reader um, can be quite harsh and um, often will not let you release something until it is absolutely perfect. And that search for perfection is, is what drives the whole field. And, and yet it can be quite um, cumbersome at times as well. I have a mother-in-law who's an artist and I know that she has gone round after she sold a painting to someone round to their house with her palette when they're not there and changed something that she didn't like on a painting <laughs> that had already been sold, right? So, so this, this gets to people across all kinds of fields. Mm, but, but 
so I've just finished editing my fourth novel and there is a joy in seeing things come together and, and being able to sm make those small gains towards perfection. And I'm really, really happy with it. It's called um, Elephants with Headlights. It's coming out in February 2020 and I'm very proud of it. Uh, it's, it's quite uh, interesting to hear about that mental process about uh, finding out when's the right time to, to let go uh, of perfection and, and get things ready. It seems to be very similar to what you talked about, the students uh, needing to adjust to away from this concept of giving the perfect right answer and doing things to 100% uh, in, in the degree that you're teaching. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Now, I, I realize that we're coming up to the end of the interview. What I wanted to ask you as a, as a parting thought is um, for all of the parents out there or, or students listening who are still in school, um, what advice would you give them about embracing creativity and embracing innovation in whatever environment they're currently being brought up in? So I'd say one of the traits as you know, would be openness. I think that openness is a really important trait to have and curiosity, of course, which comes with it. So remain curious and remain open. Don't close down doors because creativity is all about opening up your world, not closing it down, hence the flourishing that is associated with it and psychological balance and all kinds of things. Look, creativity is meant to be there in the curriculum. It's meant to be embedded in there. It's a, it's, it's in the program, but if you ring up the Department of Education, they don't know A, how to describe it, or B, how it's meant to integrate. There's no clarity on that. So a lot of this is left to individual teachers, and of course, individuals who decide that creative, a creative life might be a, a more uh, beneficial one for them. So, so stay open and, and explore different ways of learning, not just the same way of learning. And don't get too hung up on your grades. That would be a, a big, big um, piece of advice for me because it's very easy in the world that has been set up to be told, oh, I'm not good, I'm not creative, or I'm not clever because I have got a bad grade. Because creative thinking is resourceful thinking. You get it in every country without resources to you. And there's a beautiful book called Jugad on roadside frugal innovation in India. You should look that up. I mean, all countries have a version of it. It's an innate human trait and we should be growing it in all of our students and all of our, you know, everyone in the world has it, but it's, it's how open you are to it that really matters. Ben, it's been fascinating speaking with you today. Uh, if people want to find out more about your own work or, or the course that you run, um, what's the best way they can go about finding that? Well, they can um, look me up, bemlehunt.com, um, um, or they can go to Bachelor of Creative Intelligence and Innovation at UTS, or just type in BCII UTS, and they'll get to information about the degree and about my book it's coming out with transit lounge publishers really innovative interesting publisher based in melbourne i have to say i'm really excited about publishing with them because elephants with headlights is a big experimental book so many so many wonderful ideas about future thinking that i've had from working with students actually and designing up courses in future thinking um, have gone into that book and, and they're really open to it. And I'm very excited about that there. Yes, yeah, so Transit Lounge, bemlahunt.com and um, UTS BCII. Those would be three great links. Perfect. I'll make sure to get them in the description below. Uh, Bem, it's been wonderful speaking with you and I look forward to speaking again with you soon. Thank you, Nick. Lovely to speak to you too. Real pleasure. Thank you so much for listening. If you liked it, please like, share and subscribe and leave me a comment about what you thought and what you'd like to see more about. If you want to take your creativity and innovation capabilities to the next level, then invest in yourself with the premium training only available at ideatovalue.com. These exclusive training modules have all been put together by me, Nick Skillicorn, and have been used by thousands of artists, innovation leaders and CEOs to become better at understanding the source of their creativity and executing on their innovation ambitions. And there is no risk to new you as they are backed by our money-back guarantee. Now, don't forget to go out there and make your ideas a reality.
See you again soon.